Right, so today I'm going to talk about some basic electronics. In fact, I'm going to talk about some of the things that, well, I used to employ people who have both master's degrees in electronics and doctorates. And some of them didn't know this stuff, and it's really basic. And you do need to keep it in mind. So first of all, what is an electron? Well, we've all seen the atomic diagrams of the nucleus with its little neutral neutrons, its positive protons, and around it are these little tennis balls doing that in nice, neat little orbits called electrons. Well, that's what people used to think. But nowadays we know, with quantum mechanics and all the other things, that electrons aren't really like that. Electrons, in some ways, are like light. They have a probability function. So you can't really say, oh, it's a little ball. What it is is a fuzzy chain of probabilities. It's not very probable to be there, but it's very probable to be there. So electrons aren't the cut and dried things we used to think that they were. Um, now, for the purposes of starting electronics, it's not necessary for you to take that into account. When it comes to semiconductor design, actually designing ICs, transistors, and so on, that's very important. But for the moment, you can use what I call stories for children and just forget about that. Okay. So the first principle of electronics is that throughout a material, throughout a conductor, which conducts electricity from one place to another, all of the electrons want to be distributed evenly. And indeed, if you take a piece of wire and just connect the ends together, they will be distributed evenly around the wire until you connect, in between the ends of it, a device such as a battery or a generator, which has the property of making a lot of electrons available at one terminal, the negative terminal, and not enough electronics avail uh, electrons available at the other end, and that we call the positive terminal. Now, we call them that way around because in the old days, people didn't know which direction electrons travelled. And they had to make a decision, and they chose that they would travel from positive to negative. And that's why when you see a, um, a circuit diagram, the positive rail is always at the top, and the negative rail or ground is always at the bottom. And uh, it's wrong, <laughs> basically. You don't need to worry about it, but just keep in mind that that is in fact wrong, that electrons travel up from the ground towards the positive rail. Okay, now, so that's what electrons are. They want to be distributed uniformly throughout the circuit. And if they're not, this gives rise to what we call potential difference, or voltage. Now voltage is just a measure of the difference, how much charge or how many electrons are at one point compared to any other point. And one volt is the difference in charge between two points that causes a current of one amp to flow when there is an electrical resistance of one ohm between the two points. And we'll get on to resistance and current in a minute. So if you've got a difference of voltage at one point, let's say you've got 1.2 volts here, 0.8 volts there, current wants to flow from one point to the other. It wants to make everything nice and even. So that brings us to current. The flow of electrons brings us to the amp or ampere. Now, the ampere is a measure of flow. How many electrons per second are moving through a point? And if you can imagine, you've got a little man standing there next to the wire and he's got a checkboard and he's checking off every electron that passes him, then if you have a current of one amp flowing, 
That is, in actual fact, one heck of a lot of electrons. In fact, it's 6,241,500 billion billion electrons moving past a point in a second. Now, you try counting that lot, that little man's not going to get very far. So with all these electrons rushing along, there's a natural tendency for a, a lot of materials, and that includes conductors and semiconductors, to resist the passage of these electrons. And that is a phenomenon that we call electrical resistance, and it's measured in ohms. Basically, the ohm is a measure of how strongly the passage of electrons is resisted between any two points in a circuit. And one ohm is the resistance of a circuit, which is, as we said before, when a voltage of one volt causes one amp of current to flow. And from that we get Ohm's law, basically volts where V equals volts, I equals amps, R equals ohms, R equals V divided by R, or V equals I times R, or I equals V over R. So given two values, one can always find the third. And that is very useful. That is the most useful thing in electronics. And if you don't remember any other equation, please remember Ohm's law. And the way I always remember it is as a triangle. If you think of a pyramid and it's cut in half, you've got V in the top section, I and R in the bottom. So if you cover up the thing that you want to find, cover up the V, you've got IR. V equals IR. If you cover up the I, you've got V over the top of R. V over R equals I. And so on. By just remembering that little triangle, you can solve an awful lot of electrical problems. Well, power is measured in watts. And it's a measure of how quickly work is done. And the work here that's being done is moving electrons against the resistance of the material that they're flying through. And one watt is the power required to create a current of one amp in a resistance of one ohm. So the power equals the voltage times the current. Okay. So if you take the power in, which is voltage times the current at one end, you take the power at the other end of the resistor, the voltage will be lower, the current will be the same. So you can see that there's actually a power difference. And that lost power is power dissipation and it disappears inside the resistor and gets converted to heat. Or if it's the filament of an electric light bulb that is your resistor, it's converted to light and heat. But lost power is basically the power in minus the power output. And that's the same as saying that the power is I squared times R, the square of the current times the resistance. And it's important for you to keep an eye on this number because if you go and put a nice little quarter watt 10 ohm resistor and put it across a battery, what happens is it smokes and then goes bang after a little while. Um, that's because you've exceeded its power rating. If on the other hand you had a big chunky 10 watt resistor and you did the same thing, then what would happen is the battery would get very, very hot because it has its own internal resistance and dissipates power as well. So power is very important. It's something you need to keep an eye on. Now the final unit that we'll talk about is frequency. And frequency is measured in hertz. And hertz is a measure of how many times a signal occurs or changes value during a second. So if you look at the diagram here, you can count the number of peaks in one second, with the time being along the bottom and the voltage being at the left hand side, and you can see you get a figure of three. And that is a three hertz signal. And radio frequencies go up into the megahertz. Microwave frequencies go up into the gigahertz, and you know that your computer is probably two, 
3 gigahertz this clock is running at it's a very high frequency you can't see it this is why you need oscilloscopes to see signals if indeed you need to see signals most of the things we do as um, amateurs unless you're involved with radio a lot you won't actually need an oscilloscope because you can see the signal on your multimeter if you're running an LED at 1 hertz, it flashes on and off once a second it's easy enough for you to see the figures changing on your multimeter you can use things like frequency counters and build some counters of your own that will give you an exact frequency when something is happening faster and really that's all you need as an amateur um, all of these guys who are on YouTube here showing you flash digital storage scopes and everything else you don't need them really um, not unless you're doing something horrendously complicated or that needs itself to operate very fast and then it's probably cheaper to buy it multipliers uh, this is another thing that tends to confuse an awful lot of people um, simply because due to certain errors in Victorian science a bit like the plus and minus thing I talked about earlier some units, especially capacitance, are insanely large. Now, when Mr. Farad was playing about with his uh, initial capacitors that he made, what he used was great big 8-gallon milking buckets as the plates of his capacitor. Now, obviously, um, you haven't seen any 8-gallon milking buckets actually soldered into a circuit. Uh, I assume you haven't anyway I certainly haven't um, although I did once see someone order the wrong sort of capacitor and end up with one the size of a small van and then wonder why it costs them five thousand dollars but um, no so this is going from the very small like our marmoset monkey at the top to the very huge like the enormous bunny rabbit and it starts off in the middle there You've just got uh, milli, which is 0 0.01 of something, micro, 10 to the minus 6, a millionth, nano, 10 to the minus 9, a billionth, pico, 10 to the minus 12, a billionth of a billionth. And that's, that's how it goes on. Um, and it's important to, to remember that it's 10 to the 3 between each one and it's important because people have a tendency to um, tell you component values in two different ways sometimes um, one manufacturer will talk about a 0.1 microfarad capacitor another manufacturer will talk about a 100 nanofarad capacitor and they are both exactly the same thing because 100 nanofarads is 0.1 of a microfarad and in the other direction you've got kilo something times 10 to the 3 so that's in thousands and it's very important you're going to get a 10 ohm resistor mixed up with a 10 kilo ohm resistor it can happen I've done it and you see lots of smoke as a result um, you've also got mega mega ohms then you get into the giga well we don't use much in the way of giga in electronics unless it's to do with memory storage inside a computer or some sort of device that we're making then we'll use gigabytes um, then you've got Terra right at the top an absolutely huge amount 10 to the 12th and this is the normal range of units that you'll come, get, come across um, and it's worthwhile getting to grips with these and for your first little look at electronics, this is all I'm going to do. Um, I'm next going to do a tutorial entirely about resistors and resistance. And following on from that, capacitors and capacitance. Then something we haven't yet mentioned, inductors and inductance. And having done that, I'll start on the semiconductors with diodes, transistors, FETs and so on. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this short introduction. And please, please remember its contents. Thank you very much.